some ways, I'm coming from the English department, so in some ways the conversation you're starting is, is in some ways a good transition to what I'm going to talk about because doing an English department lecture is completely different in that there's really not right answers in the same way, right? Um, and I'm going to set that up as the problem in where I'm, I'm try I was trying to think of how to translate that type of understanding of English in a literature-based classroom into a large lecture. Um, I think I'm going to sit because I don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> I have a handout, just what you were talking about. So I think if, um, if it's OK, if people can see me. I think I'll just sit, if that's all right, because it's a good small group. OK, so I taught a lecture called The Monstrous Imagination in Literature. It was a gen ed course. It was designed to sort of uh, get students excited about the, the basics of literature. So reading, writing, and what I was trying to emphasize in the class a bit is uh, starting to become very comfortable with very open-ended interpretation and sort of the process of analysis that literature opens up for you. Um, that works very well in a small discussion class. And by small, I mean sort of 30 students is sort of the norm in the English department where you can really encourage students to come in with a lot of competing ideas and have that sort of lively discussion in the moment. But I was really struggling with how do I translate that into a lecture. And I really thought quite a bit about it because um, when I decided to do the lecture class, I thought, okay, when I was an undergraduate, I certainly went into English lectures, but they were very content driven, very much sort of the, the traditional lecture of here's the, the factual information, um, here's, as the professor, my interpretation, sort of learn it and replicate it. But I felt as though this is one of the few classes that are, that is one of the very few classes that are attempting to get non-English majors interested in literature. So I wanted them to understand that the liter, what I felt it is unique about literary analysis is this open-ended interpretive possibility. So I didn't want to throw that out. <laughs> but then how do I translate that into a lecture, right? So that was my dilemma. And so I really took on the course more as an experiment to see how could I get some of what I think is very unique to the intellectual inquiry that takes place in an English class. Can you get that happening in a really large lecture? And some of it was successful, some of it not. But I, you know, I think I'll just, show, just sort of tell you some of the things that I did to try to get more of the active classroom that you're talking about going. Um, and to try to get them, again, to just understand what is the nature of literary interpretation and sort of the open-ended nature of that. So I tried to break their expectations for a lecture in that I decided to come in. I did no PowerPoint, just like you're saying, because I just felt like they were expecting me to come in with PowerPoint. And I did very low tech. I just sort of made a decision. I either had to be all in or all out. And now I sometimes question that a little. But I came in and I told them, I don't want your laptops, I don't want any cell phones, nothing on the t desk. Like that is rule one. Um, and if you had a problem where you really needed to you know, use your laptop, you could come talk to me. But surprisingly, not one student made a fuss about that. So I said, clear off those desks, and that's step one. And every day I would make a big point of saying, I'm looking around, do I see any cell phones? <laughs> I don't want those in your pocket, I want them, you know. And I, fortunately, I was in the basement of um, of the Healy Library, which was a good classroom set up for that. I could actually see the students, and it was small enough. It was not 400 students. It was 125. Mm -hmm. it, the projection room, so it's, nice it's steep, uh, mm -hmm. uh, steep, so I could see everyone. Um, so I made a, a big deal about that. You know, this was low tech, no PowerPoint, that I was going to try to get a discussion feel to the class, even though it couldn't be a true discussion and that we were going to mimic some things that we do in a traditional literature class, like reading out loud in class, doing the, the think, pair, share, mini group type exercises. Um, some of my decisions around this were actually dictated by the classroom because I, I was interested in trying to do some projecting, but the way it was set up was that if I stood where I could interact with the students, the projection projected right on my forehead. <laughs> so I really had to decide, you know, what was I doing with this space? And I really... You just need to get a short person to teach that. <laughs> right, a very short person. And I really um, like to write on the board. So I, I had, and if I was projecting, it was not a board like this where I could write. It was a board that you, you know, it was a projection screen that you, you could not write on. 
So that's where I really had to make some decisions. I just decided low tech, I was pitching it as low tech. Um, but I felt like that got them to understand that what we were here to do was to practice note taking. I really made a big deal about note taking and that they had to learn to be active listeners in a class like this. That this was not a passive class, it was active and they had to take notes. And um, they had to do the basics of literature, which is reading and writing. And they had to do a lot of reading and come in prepared to talk about that. Um, so what I came up with was a, a handout type form of handling this. And I thought I'd bring in a couple just to show you. So it's just this one page pink sheet. You want to pass that yeah. way and this way. So I did have um, the, um, I did use Blackboard in terms of a way to keep track of all these handouts and all the notes that we did. Um, can we pass a big stack even further down? So, so I, most of what I tried to do was have a class that I could encapsulate on one page, <laughs> which was a task which was good for me, okay? Mm -hmm. And to try to indicate that some of it was setting up ideas, that I was coming in and building ideas, but that there were obvious gaps in what we were going to do and I was expecting them to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. through discussion and through conversation, okay? And these have, they, they have these in advance. Um, somewhat, because okay. some of these built over many days um, where, you know, we would be filling things up and kind of building as we went. But these are just two basic ones that I thought are not maybe the best, but they showed you very clearly. The one that set up like a grid, um, you can see we were working, this was very early in the class, we were working with fairy tales. And you can see how I filled out the top two grid. I was getting them to think a bit about what are these patterns we're seeing across these different fairy tales. And you can see the bottom two are empty. Obviously, that's where we were going with the class, is for them to start giving me the information that would fill that in. And as part of this, I had them do um, a quick write, which would be a little bit like the quiz idea or the clicker idea. But again, the clickers are not going to work for what I'm trying to get them to do, because I really need them to come up with varying, and I actually want them to have different answers. And they're, you know, I want to get the cross uh, that there's not one way to see these texts. So. Um, Usually what I'm doing is setting up some ideas, having them do a, some sort of a quick write in class where it's like a quiz type question where they're doing some writing. They might then share it with a partner or a small group, but then I'm expecting them to give me that information where I can start to fill in the rest of, of where we're going and hopefully their ideas are gonna reach some level of depth and complexity that I hadn't just told them <laughs> that they were gonna find that depth and complexity on their own, if that makes sense. So trying to, I, I, over time I, was, I realized that was the struggle, was to give them enough information that they would come in and have some clarity about what we were up to, but not, not overwhelm them and give them a space to feel like they were discovering some things on their own. Okay. Um, and I can give you, I'll tell you some more techniques around that, but if you look on the back, um, this is uh, from Frankenstein. And you can see how at the bottom I listed small groups where I gave them some models, and then I actually broke them up into groupish things in this classroom yeah. where you can't really break them into groups. But we just got in this habit of me saying, like, all of you over here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from this right. aisle to this yeah. aisle, you're group number one. Now talk to the two people next to you, like kind of a weird little three group cluster. And then I would go around afterwards and say, all right, everybody from number one area, who's gonna be bold? and tell me what you came up with. Do you see what I'm saying? And then I'd say, okay, over here at the back, you guys look like you're falling asleep. You're group number four, all the three rows in the back, you better tell me something to fill in that. So, mm -hmm. and then I would be writing this up on the board, um, or what I would be doing would be actually taking their notes from them and putting them up on the document camera. So that was something that I hadn't really planned on was the document camera idea, but over time that became something I used quite a bit, which, you know, it, thank goodness, that, that helped me solve the, like, how am I going to use this technology in an effective way? Because, again, I didn't want to feel like I was giving them the answers. I wanted them to feel like they were contributing, but they're, they were very hesitant to speak out loud in class 
And again, it was all just what you're saying. A lot of what I'm saying echoes what you were saying in that. It was the same students who would be raising their hands. So it was very nice for me to be able to grab some quick write that they had done, put it up on the document camera to help us answer the sort of next step in the lecture, if that makes sense. Um, so that's, so, so that was, this is in place of PowerPoint, I guess you would say, and in place of lecture notes. Some days I had more information I did have to give them. So at one point, before we talked about Frankenstein, I did want to give them a little lecture on romanticism and the fact that there is a romantic movement in literature. And, you know, I felt like I needed to give them dates and names and information. So sometimes I did do a straight lecture. But m this is more the typical mode, was sort of set up with open space, trying to get them very comfortable filling in that space. Um, so ultimately, I, I'll give you a few other techniques that I use, but before I do that, um, I, in part of the planning for the class, and now that you've seen sort of an explanation of what I was up to, I really f tried to think that the content of this course was a was a monstrous imagination. It was reading monster literature, which I just felt like it was a very obvious pitch to try to get students in to take a literature <laughs> class. But I really wanted to use that to get them to think about what do you get out of an English class and more broadly a liberal arts class. You know, why why would you ever take a class that's just about about reading and writing? So I really. Um, put a lot of this on the syllabus and I spent the first couple of days of class just explaining to them, you know, what would you be doing in a class like this? And what I came up with, I thought I would just share this because I think it ultimately was very helpful. I came up with, on my syllabus, I, I wrote down the literary method. So I kind of tried to borrow the scientific method and said, you know, you, you understand this idea about you know, hypothesis and you test an hypothesis. What's the literary method? And we, we talked quite a bit about what is literary study. And um, you know, put it on the syllabus, and we kind of created our own sense of what are the steps you go through for literary studies. So again, I was trying to get them to think about you know, what are the thinking steps they're learning in this class. And a lot of it had to do with you know, create questions, create interpretations, test those interpretations, but remain open. Um, you know, look uh, a lot of literary classes, close reading. You know, test your close readings, that type of thing. Um, the other thing I had them think about was what I call the seven deadly skills. And I tried to get them to think about what are the skills they learn in, in the liberal arts class. And those go back to reading and writing. And I think we, and you know, even that active listening idea. And I think we all know that we're seeing, I think students' skills in these areas are eroding. I mean, the idea, even to read Frankenstein, which is quite a short novel, it's a, it comes in a little over 200 pages. That was tough for some of these students. Um, you know, so just to get them to do sustained deep reading um, was difficult. And so trying to get them to see the value in that and what they're learning through that. So I tried to get them to think about the thinking process they were engaged in and some of these skills they're getting through a class like that. And then when we would turn to things like this, I would try to pull out these, again, thinking skills that we were practicing together. So if you look at the Frankenstein one, you can see the heading at the top says locating themes slash patterns slash textual evidence. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, that, that fits into some of what we were talking about, which is one of the things you learn through literary analysis is you learn to locate patterns and find patterns. And you learn to see that there's things that don't, don't look like they have any pattern. But over time, you, you realize, oh, wait a minute, there is a pattern here. And you have to uh, you know, train yourself as a, as a thinker to, to locate patterns. And obviously another thing I was trying to emphasize was the idea of the use of evidence, right? Um, which again, I think is, these are sort of interdisciplinary skills. Um, so I tried to use the <coughs> low-tech um, handouts to, to emphasize some of the skills that they were learning. And I think just to sort of wrap up, some of the other techniques that I used to try to get this across they sound quite similar to what you were doing. I never used clickers. I don't know how I would use this, but I'd have to think about it. But I, I tried to get them to do this sort of think, pair, share kind of buzz a little bit in the classroom. That seemed to work because, again, I could call on groups without them feeling as though they were um, not prepared. You know, they could feel that they were very prepared to answer that. I had them read out loud in class, and I had them I had individual um, volunteers to do that. But then I also got in the habit, which worked quite well of finding very short passages where I would make the whole 150 of them read out loud together. 
So we would read like a stanza from a poem, or we would read a passage from, a, you know, like a post short story or something. It just grabbed them, and I'd make them read it a couple times. We read it like maybe three times out loud, and I'd say, "Now with more emphasis." <laughs> and lo and behold, those those quotes showed up on their exams. <laughs> Little did they know, but then they kind of got into it, you know, and they kind of realized what what we were up to. Um, but they had a lot of fun with that, and I, that was just a like a a thought out of desperation, like how can I get their voices in the classroom? And it, it worked really well. So I, then I started using it more. Um, creating space for the questions from the audience, um, using, as I said, those sort of quizzes or quick writes. I usually tried to get them to write in paragraph form because, again, I wanted them to think of the fact that they were practicing the writing skills. And the other thing I got in the habit of doing was opening a, tech, um, a literary text and just copying one page of it and passing it around and saying, now you have to practice your close reading skills. I want you to mark up this passage. Just read silently and get those pencils going, mark it up. I want to see a lot of marginal notes. Because this, this was the thing that would shock me, is that I'd say, okay, we're going to talk about this chapter. What passages are people finding? And I'd look around and no one had any notes in there, but we know this, right? <laughs> and for, liter for literary analysis, you have to get in the habit of taking marginal notes. So that would be the type of thing, again, I would grab and put up on the document camera. So say, you, look at these notes. You people just pick them at random and put them up on the document camera? Yes. Okay. And then, so then again, they woke up and they realized, yes. I better write a lot <laughs> <laughs> during, <laughs> when she's saying write, I better write because <laughs> I might grab it. And you know, I was doing this all in a pretty low key way, but they, I think the document camera was the sort of cold call mechanism yeah, yeah, yeah. that I was using. Well, um, and certainly when, so. I was like, when you give them a blank page to write something on, that's when you really find out what they know and don't know. Right. Um, Right. That's interesting. And I mean, multiple choice just doesn't work very no. well with the type of way that I was thinking about what this class no, is about. So it really had to be, and you know, to have yeah. that amount of paper flowing in and out would sometimes get a bit complicated, but I think we kind of found a pattern for doing that. And then the last thing I would say is towards the end of the class, what I sort of moved towards was getting the students to do more um, generating of questions and sort of note taking before the class that I got to this point where I'd get them to, in a small group, create a little mini handout that the group was responsible for that then they would send to me that then I could bring in. It would look like this, right? And get them to be the ones generating this. And you know, obviously I, I would have seen it and would add some of my thinking. It, we didn't, that was, again, this was evolving in real time because it was the first time I had done it. And I think I, I'd embed that more from the beginning and a bit more successfully. But I think that would be the ultimate goal, would be to make um, subgroups responsible for generating something like this that then I could bring in. Um, so the students themselves are sort of presenting the questions. And then they are ultimately, in some ways, starting to create the agenda for the class. Which again, that's where we get them, I think, in an upper level literature class. Is that, of course, there's an agenda, but they're, they're starting to create the content within that. Um, so to try to get that to happen on a lower level class when they're non-English majors and then in this large lecture class, I, I sort of, I guess, discovered by teaching the class that that is what I was ultimately trying to get them to do. Um, so I mean, there were, some, there were some failures to this, which I'm more than happy to talk about. But one of them was that the students were just thinking of this as um, the right answer type mode. It goes back to what we were talking about. They were really uncomfortable with the fact that there, there wasn't just one thing that they were supposed to be writing down in each bullet point area. And then the other was that they were very concerned with thinking of this as quizzes that were going to be graded. And they just became very much, you know, well, what does this mean for my grade? And when I was really trying to get them to think that this is to set up the conversation in the class. So I'm more than happy to talk about some of the other difficulties. <laughs> but, but that gives you a sense of just you know, what I was working with and trying to aim towards. I don't think it was 100% successful, but I think I hit upon a few things that were starting to work well. So. How do you think the students in that class did in developing the skills you were after as compared to a more traditional class? Well, I think ultimately su successful in that at least they understood that they were supposed to be developing these skills. Whether or not they put the effort in was the difficulty of a large lecture in my court. In, when I'm in a small class, I know if they're doing the work or not because they're doing a lot of paper writing for me. 
it becomes very clear in a small class who's not doing the reading. And the difficulty with a large classroom for a literature class is that they do have to do a pretty hefty amount of reading, and the reading is enjoyable. It's fiction. It's monster stories. Mm -hmm. But it's just amazing you know, how, how many of the students, I think, were not doing the reading. And they would bluff it a bit in, the, in these ways. Um, so that, I think, if they put the effort in, they were definitely getting these skills. And I think some of them were maybe at least thinking about those skills, even if they were faking it a little bit. Uh, but I think they ultimately got the whole point, which was to, to think that this was a different mode of thinking that they, I wanted them to engage in. So I think they got that.